Hello, this is Tom, a.k.a. Jadion here for Tabletop Taproom. We're on the Rediscovering AD&D series. We're going to be talking about clerics, deities, and spells today. And it's we're going to look at a little chapter in the Dungeon Master's Guide, pull out some high points in it, and the, some takeaways, and then I'm going to talk about how I would modify this. And... Um, so it's going to be my homebrew, I guess, how I would approach it. I, I, but I think, I think the modifications are a little bit, for the most part, they're cosmetic, and they actually add more flavor for the whole realm of running a cleric and a deity. Uh, not a, <laughs> running a deity. Yeah. <laughs> that would be that Beck Me. <laughs> Immortal level games of Beck Me. No, no, no. We're not running deities. We're uh, for running the cleric, but it it, it uh, changes. I think I want to institute are more evocative of uh, of the whole cleric and religion theme going on with the cleric. But before we get to that, I just want to say uh, thanks for watching the video. Thanks to my subscribers. You guys are great. And if you've not subscribed, please do hit the like, subscribe bell icon. And while you're at it, consider hitting the link in the show notes for the Cafe Press store. Or we sell a little bit of merch, just supports the channel. So, moving right along, moving right along to the Dungeon Master's Guide, my handy dandy PDF. And we want to jump to page 38. Actually, no, we want to jump to page 39. In the book, it's page 38. In the PDF, it's page 39 because of the cover being page one of the PDF. So, the chapter that we're on here is character spells, but we're only going to be looking at day-to-day -day acquisition um, of cleric spells. And there's some interesting things in here. There's another clue to something I brought up in the previous video concerning henchmen and the possibility of PVP, that whole idea that you would have henchmen. One of the reasons for having henchmen is they henchmen protect you against the machinations of other players. Uh, which I found very fascinating. But here's another clue. Here's another clue. The first paragraph reiterates the whole Vancey and magic system that you're going to memorize your spells, your cleric spells, the hand motions, the dominus, onus, and the words, and they are an energy trigger. And when you perform the energy trigger, pfft, it's gone, gone out of your head. You lose all memory of it. And you're no, you know, and it's, you, you, you can't just keep recasting that spell. It's gone now. You've cast it the one time, fancy and magic system, it's gone. So it's, it's a reiteration of, of the fancy and magic system for clerics that you're going to memorize them in the morning. And when you cast it, it's gone. That's the first paragraph. The second paragraph specifies that the, player must choose a deity. Then the really interesting statement here is, and, and, and again, you would go to the deities and demigods, or maybe the da dungeon master has created a pantheon himself. Uh, let's talk about the pantheons for a second. You know, as a 12 year old, good little Catholic boy going to Catholic school, I was always a little bit uncomfortable with the real world pantheons in the deities and demigods. Very fascinated by it. Um, I liked reading Greek mythology. I was a weird kid. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Greek and Roman mythology. And I, I very fascinated with these, but I did not, I was not comfortable because of the, you know, the Catholic baggage um, was not comfortable with saying my character worships this deity from this pantheon that's based on a real world pantheon. You know, when I came back to D&D at, at third edition, because I skipped second, being away from D&D, when I came back to third edition and, and they had fictionalized deities in there, I was like, oh, this is, I, yeah, this is fine. Happy with that. So I was much happier with a fictionalized pantheon. But I, I do like the idea of uh, an overarching pantheon that... Uh, you don't have to have one God for every single alignment, but you know, <laughs> one God for every single alignment and then one God for the elves and one for the dwarves, one for the half, you know, you don't need that, but uh, 
you know, a decent with the smattering of good and neutral and evil within there, I think works, but I definitely like a fictionalized pantheon. And I like to steal something right out of game of Thrones. You know, you have the couple of different pantheons, you have the old gods, there are, there are pantheon. And then you have the new gods, you know, if, to take the game of Thrones idea, you know, and then you'd have fun elven pantheon and a dwarven pantheon, separate pantheons. Why not? They're separate races. And uh, they're they're thing unto themselves. So, I feel like their god wouldn't even be part of the human pantheon. And you know they should have a fairly well developed pantheon. And then we're going to see this statement in here about servants of the supernatural deities. So the pantheon should also have within it those servants. Now, a classic example would be in the Greek pantheon. You have Venus, and then Cupid. And uh, Cupid's associated with Venus, and he doesn't have the status of Venus. So he's a supernatural servant of Venus. And so it works. So you know, he's ill-defined. Is he an angel? I don't know. He's got wings. But he's not called an angel. He's called a god. But I guess we'd call him a demigod. You know, So he's a different status altogether. Some of these servants might have, you, know, you might call them angels. You might just have, there's a stat block for angels. And the angels within this pantheon, these are their step. They, they have names, but we don't have to track them. It's not that important. You know, it could be demons. It could be that the, the evil gods within the pantheon have some demons that serve them. I don't know. It depends on what flavor you want. You could use saints, you know, St. Cuthbert. Uh, I think that was the, wasn't that the saint in the Dairy Nye trilogy, St. Cuthbert or... I remember reading some fiction novel, fantasy fiction novel, and, and like there was Saint Cuthbert was like a thing in there. And so you could have this, you know, saints, you could you have you want to have these represented in the pantheon, and that's going to become a little more evident here as we get into spells. So you have this uh this choice of deity, but the choice of deity in this paragraph. There's this interesting statement here that says this will not necessarily establish the alignment of the character. You don't say, really? What? Huh? That's kind of funny because I felt I always, I part of me always felt like choice of deity dictated choice of alignment. <laughs> so you went alignment shopping when you were choosing deities, but they're saying like you could be a follower of a deity and not of the proper alignment, not of the exact same alignment. So um, this, this the last half of the sentence actually then is the um, dropping the other shoe. It's not necessarily the established the alignment of the character. So at the same time, the cleric player character should also state his or her ethos i.e. alignment, not necessarily to other players. Excuse me, what? I'm not going to tell other players my alignment now. <laughs> to a certain degree, some things are going to be obvious, like, hmm, I wonder what the alignment of that paladin is. <laughs> I, he's hiding it from me, I, I, so I don't know what that paladin's alignment is. <laughs> you know? Um, that guy, that that's an assassin character. I wonder what his alignment might be. <laughs> no, I mean, some things are going to be obvious, certainly. But and and to me, it seems funny that you're hiding alignment um, per se. But there's but this is really uh, this 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 harkens back to that PvP discussion we had in the previous video that other players might not have your best interest at heart. And they might take advantage of your player character. The word was machinations of other player characters. And that uh, you would have, that's why you would have henchmen to help protect you against those machinations. So this idea that you hide information about your player character from other player characters, other players, uh, harkens back to that. You know, it's that because in the real world, we don't go out in the real world and 
tell everybody everything about ourselves. You know, it's that whole don't talk politics and religion. <laughs> so, you know, we don't go out in the real world and hey, yeah, you know, we leave our house unlocked at night. Um, yeah, we leave the keys to the car in the driveway. We leave the keys in the car in the driveway. You know, you know, <laughs> so you're just out there in the world telling everybody this. You're giving people ideas. Oh, let's go by his house. Free car. <laughs> pick it up, just pick it up at three in the morning. <laughs> you know, yeah, we just won the lottery. Got a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Oh, hey, uh, you know, I, I need a loan. I, I need to borrow some money. You know, we, we you don't go out there and tell everything about you. You hold things back. So uh, I don't know that it's so important to hide alignment. You know that we're going to be like Texas Hold'em. There's a few cards up and a few cards down, and you're 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 pulling up the, your cards and you know making your bet based off of what you see on the table from the other cards that are face up. And, uh, you know, so you're going to put a piece of paper on top of your character sheet to hide everything. And then when the game master says, how many hit points you got left? And you're like, uh, less than 20. <laughs> Not even telling the game master how many hit points I have. <laughs> you know, it's, um, I, I, I don't see that it's that important. I don't, I don't know why you would want to hide your alignment. But I can see the need to not telling everything about your character to the other players at the table, especially if you're in that 70s era, early 80s era style of game where there's a large stable of players who could play in. So you're getting different people all the time. And, you know, you've got a large group of people. Somebody might not get along with you. Somebody might decide... I'm playing an evil character anyways. I'm going to go ahead and pick his pocket. I'm going to go ahead and backstab him. Oh, he got the Vorpal Sword. I want that. So it's time for a little bit of assassination with the poison dagger in the back while he's sleeping. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so you, you, you could get that. So you don't, don't necessarily want to reveal everything. Oh, so what magic items you got? None of your business. How much gold you got? None of your business. <laughs> Which God do you serve? Well, um, see as how I'm doing healing prayers to such and such a God. Um, <laughs> that'll be obvious. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I could see the value to maybe holding back some information about your player character. I don't know about the alignment, but this idea that Gary has written in here about holding back your alignment, not telling it to other players, it dovetails into that other idea of PVP, that the other players are not necessarily your friends, that they're, well, it's not that the players are not necessarily your friends, their character that they're playing is not necessarily the friend of your character that you're playing. I think. That's an important distinction, probably. So to me, this is like the biggest shoe drop in this whole this whole uh, chapter is this idea that uh, I gotta hide my alignment from the other player characters. I don't I don't feel like that's important, but the fact that it's written in there suggests that you are hiding information about your player character from the other players. So the Last part of the paragraph is the other big takeaway here. And it says, it is then assumed that prior to becoming a first level cleric, the uh, player character received a course of instruction, served a novitiate, and has thoroughly read and committed to memory the teachings and prayers to his or her chosen deity. So that the character is dedicated to the deity and is able to perform as a cleric thereof. It is this background which enables the character uh, to use first-level spells. You're going to see here what, what he, Gary is building in here is a tier system to, to spells for the clerics. Now, what he should have put uh, to, to, to use first-level spells, he should put a, instead of a period, he should put an and second-level spells. Because then he goes to the trouble to write a whole another paragraph here that says, Furthermore, 
continued service and activity on behalf of the player character deity empower him to use second level spells as well but thereafter another agency must be called upon so basically just being devoted to the deity gives you the ability to use first and second level spells well first level spells at starting but continued service leads to when you advance on level second level spells then you get this next tier which is uh, clerics spells of third, fourth, and fifth level are obtained through the aid of supernatural servants of the cleric's deity. <clears throat> that would be, you know, the example of Venus and Cupid. So you are, are a cleric of Venus, let's say, if we're using that pantheon, but you'd be going to Cupid to get spells. So third, fourth, and fifth, you must go to a, a supernatural servant of the deities then the cleric spells of sixth and seventh level are granted through direct communion from the deity itself there's no intermediary in this case and the cleric has direct channel to the deity from whom he or she receives special power to cast given spells of the these levels now uh, i'm going to propose a little bit of a departure w one thing is cosmetic stop calling them spells they are prayers, rituals, and miracles. First and second level, that first tier that you just learn because you learned them, they're prayers. So you've done your novitiate, you've done your study, you've been ordained a cleric. Um, these are the prayers. You learn them, you cast them. Let's call them prayers. It's more evocative of the flavor of what we're doing here with the cold cleric having a cleric in the game so you would instead of it being cure light wounds spell it's cure light wounds prayer it's there instead of it being uh, resist cold to be the prayer of resisting cold um <clears throat> instead of uh you know it would be the uh prayer of finding traps you know oh lord let me find these traps in this dungeon you know the so on and so forth so <laughs> I want to cast the prayer of spiritual hammer. My second level spell there. The third, fourth, and fifth level spells, call them rituals. You know, so that's going to be, you're going to have the ritual of animate dead. The ritual of dispel magic. The ritual of speak with dead. You know, so on and so forth. And then sixth and seventh level, let's call those miracles. Why not? Because you can only cast them if you're in divine in direct communion with, with the divine, with the deity that you serve. So it's prayers, rituals, and uh, miracles. And it's we've not changed those tiers at all. We've just cosmetically changed the names. Now, here's the thing I want to actually change that violates the rules. That's because, you know. This, this is my game, right? This is my homebrew, is that the cleric must have a prayer book. And the prayers he's learned, it's not that he's got to go to the prayer book and, and you know, if he loses his prayer book, he can't do those prayers anymore because he's got to memorize. You, you memorize the shepherd's psalm, Psalm 26, the Lord is my shepherd. You, you can recite it. doesn't matter. I don't have a Bible handy to look it up. You know, I memorized it so I can recite it, right? It's not as big a crisis for the uh, cleric as it would be for the magic user, but he's going to have a book similar to the magic user having a book, and these are his prayers, and it's through his, you know, and his, and his rituals. And you don't get all of the prayers. You've only learned so many, but as you encounter more, and you learn them, or as you go up in level and you spend a little time at the monastery and study adding more prayers to your book, adding more rituals to your book, uh, you've learned those. Whatever prayers and rituals you know, you just cast. You don't have to charge the slot with, you know, light and resist cold. So that if your character walks into the village and the village, they're followers of the pantheon that you follow, but you find they're all sick. Oh, geez, too bad. I memorized light this morning. You know, I, you know, I've got, 
my prepared spells are light and resist cold and sanctuary. Uh, come back tomorrow. I hope you don't die. We'll cure you tomorrow. We'll get cure light wounds. We'll take care of it tomorrow. No, no, no. You know the prayer of cure light wounds. You know, you know that prayer of healing. So you you just go and um, you use all of your spell slots to do that prayer of healing. Even like say you've got a second level prayer slot, spell slot, you can cast the lower level spell in its place. And so you can go around and heal everybody in the village using up all of your, your prayer slots, uh, doing the same prayer over and go, even though that's not what you prepared that morning, you could just do it. Whatever prayers you know, those are what you can cast. Same with rituals. If you've learned the ritual, you can just perform the ritual. It doesn't matter. What really matters is, is you can only do one third level ritual, then that's it. You've got one third level ritual, but you've learned three rituals. You don't have to prepare which one you're going to do for that day. It's just as the opportunity presents, you say, oh, um, you know, uh, one of the party got blinded during a battle. So, you know, I happen to know the ritual of cure blindness. So therefore I will perform the ritual of cure blindness, heal my compatriot, and we can continue adventuring. We don't have to leave the dungeon and, uh, you know, go back and we're good. We can keep on adventuring. So that's how I'd handle it. And so you have to learn your prayers. You have to learn your rituals, but you, you do that organically. Um, as you go up in level, you get to learn a new one uh, put in there. You can, you might find a spell scroll with a cleric spell and, you know, cleric prayer, a prayer scroll. <laughs> it's, you'd want to copy that, you know, down. You, uh, your character needs to spend a few weeks at the monastery anyways to rest and heal up. While you're there, you might as well... Um, invest some time learning some new spells in the library. Why not? So it's, I want to dump the Vancey and magic, magic system for the cleric, particularly on first, second, third, fourth, and fifth level spells. You learn the prayer, you learn the ritual, you just do it. The sixth and seventh level spells, you don't have to learn that spell because it's you've got to be in direct communion with the deity. The deity just empowers you with a miracle. So it's whatever miracle the deity wants to give you. You can beseech the deity that you follow for a specific miracle. And you would do that by making a wisdom check. Do a wisdom ability check. Pass, you get what you want. Fail, you get what the dice dictate you're going to get per the whim of the dice or per the whim of the deity or per the whim of the game master. Maybe I know what's coming in the dungeon. And so I'm going to just do a little DM fiat and say, you get this spell. Cause I kind of think maybe it might come in useful for you. So the miracles you wouldn't record in your, in your prayer book, but uh, all the other spells, the prayers and the rituals you would. So that is the modification I would do there. Now the next a thing in this chapter, you get into this whole idea of you've pissed the deities off. You have sinned. And I think the implication of the sin is the whole alignment issue. And I, I kind of feel like it, it puts the game master on notice that you've got to be recording the sins of the player character. And keeping track of those. And I don't know that I want to do that unless they're biggies. Unless they're biggies. I don't want to have to track, oh, you violated your alignment by doing this in the dungeon. You violated your alignment here by doing this. Uh, you allowed the paladin to go murder hobo. <laughs> and you didn't speak against it. <laughs> you know, therefore, the, the divine powers are angry with you. Um, so yeah, the a murder hobo paladin, that sounds like something interesting, but <clears throat> this whole next section is, is that if these divine servants to provide you your 
the power to do your rituals are upset because you've sinned, they're going to withhold the power for you to do the rituals. So then you must seek. Um, so then you must seek their, Hey, what's going on? They're going to tell you what you've done wrong, give you a task or a penance to perform. And they might provide you with a few spells, a few rituals to uh, be able to do, but you won't get any more until the task or the penance is completed. And the same thing goes on with the divine, the, the miracle level, that, that upper tier, that if the deity, the deity is going to let you know what you did wrong, upgrade you for that, get, and, and more or less give you a quest, not just a penance of fast for two days, fast for three days. This is like quest time. Give you a quest. The deity will then give you some of those high level spells that they choose. And that's all you get until the quest is completed. Now, the, the funny thing there is I was always under the impression is that you learn the spells. It's only for one day. You got to learn new the next day. This idea that you would get these spells under the Vancian system and you would have this power, this trigger. And, and, and I really endorse this. If the deity gives you this miracle, it, it's the whole Vancian idea. It's there's an energy trigger. You trigger it, you lose it. <clears throat> so the deity's not happy with you. They've given you a quest. They give you these, these high level spells that they choose. And you're not getting any more till you complete the quest. Well, the quest could go multiple days. So, therefore, you don't lose spells you haven't cast or miracles. And, therefore, you this whole idea of you've got to do the, the rest, the proper rest and recharge, you may not actually have to do it because you didn't cast the high-level spells. So therefore, they're still lingering there. And why wouldn't they linger there for you if you were in good the good graces of your character's deity as opposed to the bad? Because under the bad, here you, you're in trouble and you've got a quest, but you're given spells and they linger in your head day to day to day to day. <clears throat> then, you know, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem equitable that. Oh, you're in the good graces, but you lose it every day, so you got to get new every day. I think you could just hang on to those miracles from day to day if you wanted to. That would be a possibility in game. So I would dispense with the whole idea of Vancean energy triggers. And once you cast it, you lose it. You've got to get it new. You know, you got to get it in your head in the morning, and it's there until you do the right words and actions. I would lose that for everything through fifth level. And then your sixth and seventh level, your, your miracle grade spells, those are treated the old way. Deity gives it to you. That's what you have. It's an energy trigger in your head. You have the power to do that miracle because the deity has dictated it. And you're in direct communion with the deity through prayer, through meditation. They're pleased with you, so they give you this power. Now, what I would allow is the adventure is going on, and you've got, let's say, you have uh, one seventh level spell, and the deity gave you earthquake. Fantastic! You've got it. You're holding it in reserve. You're not, you know, flouting it. And one of the other player character dies. It's like, oops, we really need resurrection. We really need, you know, a uh, resurrection here. Um, so you can actually go in prayer to the deity, make a wisdom check, you know, beseech the deity. I might even make your role pro at, uh, to a certain extent, this beseeching the deity. You know, this, this is a fellow servant. Uh, he does worship within the pantheon. Um, <clears throat> he has not devoted himself to your graces, but... Um, you know, he has been a good companion. He, he has aided me in, in uh, the quest that you have sent me on. So please uh, give me the power to resurrect. So you could switch in-game 
through a wisdom check to resurrection it, because you haven't blown that you haven't you, you had earthquake and you hadn't you hadn't performed it yet you get it switched to uh, resurrection so that, that's that's something I would allow in game it feels very organic it feels right it feels like it would work it it, it maintains the flavor of I am a servant of this deity. You know, my character is a servant of this deity, and I'm, you know, and it maintains that whole flavor of prayers, rituals, miracles. You then come down to this idea of changing your deity. Why would you do that? Well, you know, maybe you've just been on the outs because you just keep violating your alignment as a player character. And so the servants of your deity, your deity itself, are all like, we're not giving you the power to do these rituals and these miracles anymore until this is done and you just don't want to do that quest. Well, then maybe you might want to switch to a different deity. The problem there is that it, it, um, you know, it says that your former deity and its servants are going to mark you. I don't know what that means. It's open to interpretation. So almost like the mark of Cain from the Old Testament. <laughs> Walking around, and servants of your, de of your former deity can see the mark upon you. They know you're marked. That's going to cause trouble for you in game. I'm okay with that as a game master. But the new deity doesn't, and its servants doesn't necessarily trust you. So maybe they're holding back some of that spell power, some of the ritual and... Also, you learned the prayers of the previous deity. You have not learned the prayers of this deity. you got to spend some time learning the prayers and the rituals. And so you've got to learn those things, and so you get to start a whole new prayer book. So <laughs> to that, uh, you got to start a whole new prayer book um, to record those prayers and rituals you're learning so that you'll be able to cast those manifestations of power. And again, you know, the, the, the miracles are, we're not, um, you know, we're, we're, we're reverting back to the Vancean scheme for the miracles, but the new deity doesn't, um, doesn't trust you. And then it specifies that if you, that, it's 90% likely the original deity will never take you back. So there's a 10% chance you could switch back to the original deity. Uh, <laughs> but, but then it says if you switch a third time, that that that's instant death. So note to self, <laughs> do not change deities three times in AD&D. Bad stuff happens. It's instant death. The, de the divinely killed, no saving throw. It's just boom. You're dead. Done. Character gone. <laughs> Why would you ever make this decision? I don't know. And towards the end of the, that paragraph, it then specifies that a change of alignment might force a, a change of deity. Ah. <sighs> I don't know how I feel about that. Um, I, I, I really don't know how I feel about that because um, I've been a religious person and I am not easily swayed. I've had people come at me and they'd be like, you know, and I'm like, I'm just not easily swayed because when you dedicate yourself to a, a religious belief, it is, you know, it's it, it is a dedication now. So you might be dedicated to good or to balance neutrality. I like to call it neutrality balance or to evil. But then you have the other continuum, the ethos continuum of being lawful or chaotic, you know, chaos. And in the real world, I've seen this play out in people. And in, in and and in in the real world, it's less evident just in everyday life. But when you go to a seminary, when you attend seminary, you attend a Bible college, it's more of a pressure cooker 
because you're in there and you're discussing, you're discussing ethics and you're discussing, uh, we call it coffee shop theology because you're standing around with a cup of coffee and you're, you're shooting the bullshit over what you're studying. And, um, or, or maybe I shouldn't have said that, but shooting the breeze over. And so you've got people on a continuum that we call law and grace. And so some people within religious organizations are very much the rules, the rules, the rules, the rules. Thus it is written. The Bible says this, that this is what it says. This is what we kind of do. You didn't do that. That's a problem. So you have people who are very rules focused and they're still good people. And then you have people who are very grace focused who are, yeah, it's less about the rules. It's more about the person and they're more inclined to be forgiving. And then you have some people who are like, it's just grace, baby. And there's no rules. <laughs> they're way out there on a far extreme. And, you know, and, and, and people can be anywhere on that. And so because it's Bible college and seminary can be such a pressure cooker and, 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 and you're, you discuss and you debate and you push and you prod and, you know, because you're, you're, you're learning this stuff and you're trying to figure out where you stand. There can be a little bit of, of friction between you, not necessarily the professors, but between you and the other students. And that's good. That's important. That's part of the process. And, and so you see this, somebody falls a little more on the, on the law, you know, no, look, this is the rule. I, 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 you know, and, and they, in their integrity, are like, I just can't cross that line. This is what it says. I feel like I have an obligation. God made that command. I got and on integrity. I, I can't cross that line. And, 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 and that's okay. And, you know, then you have, on the other hand, people are like, yeah, I want to, I want to err more on the side of grace. And as a younger man, I was more on, let's err on the side of the law. I feel like we will make fewer mistakes if we just stick to, here's what it says. Let's just do what it says, you know, but as I've gotten older and I've messed up along the way, and I've experienced grace, and I've not been held. I've not held my feet, had my feet held to the fire on law, on a rule. And I've experienced grace. I've come to the point where I've I've shifted on that ethos continuum from law to grace. Now in D and D, we would call that, you know, law <clears throat> neutral in the middle, chaos on the far extreme. Um, you know, in seminary, we don't go to the chaos extreme per se. We do encounter people who go to the chaos extreme. We do encounter people in evangelical circles who do go to the chaos extreme. No rules, everything. Every, the, yeah, we don't have any rules. No, there are no rules. It's whatever. We do encounter that from time to time. Uh, I think most are somewhere in the middle and, and, and then you find people leaning one way or the other. So I like, because I see it in the real world, I like the law neutral and chaos ethos as a horizontal ethos. And I like good, neutral and evil as a vertical uh, alignment. And I actually like the idea that the player character, the player has more control over the horizontal ethos between, you know, law and chaos. And I like that idea because I see it in the real world. I see it in people because, you know, again, I, I, I lived in that pressure cooker of seminary and, um, and I have a lot of friends who are, ordained and in the ministry. I have friends who are missionaries on foreign field outside of America. So you know, I've seen this play out because I've butted heads with some of them over questions. You, you know, I've brought it, you know, I was the doubting Thomas. I was the guy always asking a lot of questions and, and I, I've, I prodded people. So why? So you're telling me that, why? You're giving me a pad answer. What's the why? You know, I was the doubting Thomas. I kept 
poking and prodding and usually cause a little bit of trouble. So I've butted heads with some of these people and I've seen this play out with them. And, and then somebody who I knew as a very strong rule follower encounter them 10, 15 years later. And I'm like, what happened to you? <laughs> look at, look at you airing on the side of grace. What happened to you? I, I, I've seen this, um, ethos continuum play out in real life that uh, people slide along it as they move through life. And so I actually would be in favor of the player having control of that ethos continuum for their character, that they are able to move their character along that ethos continuum. Um, not, you know, well, today I'm lawful and tomorrow I'm chaotic. And no, not just all over the place, but they could develop their character over time and have their character shift a little bit and, and leave that in, the, in, a, in a mature player's hands. I, 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 to me, I feel like that's something I should endorse with the alignment system. That, but the you know the the vertical good and evil <clears throat> alignment I, I feel like that should be much more solid however D, D endorses this idea that your alignment could change principally through magical effects or that you have so violated your alignment repeatedly the game master is going to enforce an alignment shift on your character i would point out though that that you violating your alignment, that is actually in the player's control. So that goes right back to my idea that the ethos, this ethos, this horizontal ethos of law, neutral chaos should be in the player's control. It actually really is. Um, there, to a certain extent, you choosing to violate your, your alignment, your specified alignment that you chose for that character, and so many times that the game master enforces an alignment change, well, then that really was in your power, wasn't it? That was really your choice, I guess. But you then have the magical effects. I think things like, I believe the deck of many things has a card that will change your alignment. You know, but then you, you could have dungeons where you go through this portal, you get an alignment change. We're going to roll a dice and boom. Your line, or a wish spell would, would potentially do it. Um, you know, that... Uh, wasn't there wasn't there a helm of alignment change? That's kind of a cursed item, I guess. I, it seems like I remember a helm of alignment change. You put it on and boom, your alignment changes. Uh, so this idea that just changing your alignment could change your deity. Um, I suppose if the alignment change goes from good to evil, you would be forced to change your deity. But I don't necessarily think that it should happen on the the horizontal continuum. The falling, yeah, I used to be more on the follow the rules law, uh, and but now I'm erring more on you know, and we we dress it up with a nice word. I err on the side of grace now, less law. Uh, that wouldn't necessarily, I don't feel like that would necessarily force a deity change, but definitely going from good to evil, that's probably got to force the deity change. So I guess I do endorse that from this paragraph. Some cosmetic changes, prayers, rituals, miracles, and uh, I advocate dumping the Vancean uh, magic system for everything through fifth level spells however you get the limitation of it must be in your prayer book you've got to have a prayer book it's less problematic for you to lose that prayer book if you lost it you know you could just go out and go to the monastery get in the library and recopy all the ones that you already knew just so you have it it's it's i feel like it's less problematic that prayer book really is just about a list that you keep that's what you know because you've memorized it. So as long as you've got that prayer memorized, you can always pray that prayer. <clears throat> and the magical effect is going to happen unless you're in bad standing with the deity. You know, as long as you know that ritual, you can always perform that ritual 
the magical effect is going to happen, providing you are in good standing with the deity. So, and then the um, miracle level stuff, sixth and seventh level spells, we revert, revert back to a Vancian style of energy trigger. You, that's what you've been empowered with from the deity, and that's what you got. And so once you use it, you lose it, and you must continually stay in, in communion with the deity and in good standing with the deity to get more miracles. And it's usually the game master or the dice choosing what you get, with the exception that you could supp you know, make a supplication, you know, beseech force. And so under that circumstance, wisdom check. And I feel like that would work. I feel like that would have the flavor I want for my game. And I, I'm i like, yeah. Um, I, I really feel like that's what would work for me and for my game. And even though we're dumping the Vance in, we are doing the limit of you got you to gotta learn the spell. You don't get them all. You have to learn them. You have to learn those prayers. So you've learned some, and you can learn more as you advance in level or as you discover prayers. Um, you know, prayer scrolls, you discover books with rituals written in them. You, oh, let's write it down. This is uh, my review of acquisition of spells for clerics. But it, the discussion really trailed into relating to the pantheon, relating to alignment, and relating to um, the deities and their servants. And I just find it fascinating that there's this little clue in here that supports the PVP discussion that we had on henchmen. Who knows? Maybe there are more scattered throughout the Dungeon Master's Guide. I just don't know. But this is Tom signing out for Tabletop Tap Room. Thanks for watching the video. Thanks to my subscribers. You guys are great. And keep on gaming. Mm -hmm.